All right, we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the launch event for the Affordable Energy for Humanity Global Change Initiative, a partnership between the University of Waterloo and the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. My name is Nigel Moore. I'm manager of global programs and initiatives at the Waterloo Institute of Sustainable Energy, uh, which is the host of today's event. The Affordable Energy for Humanity initiative is an emerging international collaboration on the topic of improving access to energy. Today we'll hear from the co-directors of the initiative, two eminent energy experts hailing from two of Canada and Germany's leading applied science institutions. First, we'll hear briefly from Professor Joachim Nebel of KIT, and then our keynote lecture entitled Affordable Energy for Humanity, If Not Now, When, will be delivered by Professor Jatin Nathwani of the University of Waterloo. Following the lecture, which should last approximately an hour, uh, Professor Nathwani will take some questions and then a wine and cheese reception in the uh, adjacent fishbowl room uh, will take place after that. Um, now to properly introduce today's speakers, the co-directors of this initiative. Your keynote speaker today is Professor Jatin Nathwani, Executive Director of the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy. Professor Nathwani serves on several boards at the provincial and, and national levels. He's scientific advisor to the Waterloo Global Science Initiative, chair of the Board of Canadian Universities Network of Excellence in Nuclear Energy, member of the Ontario Smart Grid Board uh, Forum, board member of the Ontario Centre of Excellence, member of the Clean Tech Advisory Board of the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, member of the Council for Clean and Reliable Electricity, and others. The Affordable Energy for Humanity Global Change Initiative began as a gleam in his eye, and today we are all lucky enough to hear his passionate telling of the energy access story. And finally, Professor Dr. Joachim Nabel, who will you hear from first, is head of Division Three Mechanical Engineering and Electrical Engineering at KIT. It comprises 36 institutes, including two kit departments, Mechanical Engineering and Electrical Engineering and Information Technologies, as well as three Helmholtz programs on storage and cross-linked infrastructures, nuclear waste disposal and safety, and nuclear fusion. Across scientific dis disciplines and research pro programs, he shapes and organizes research and innovation work supporting the German Energy Wende and the mobility systems of the future. Within the Helmholtz Association of German Research Centers, Professor Nabel is spokesperson of the cross-program activity on electromobility and contact person for the Helmholtz Initiative Energy System 2050. He received his PhD in theoretical mechanical engineering from Karlsruhe Technical University, is Professor Honoris Causa of St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg State University, and received the, the European Science Culture Award of the European Foundation for Culture Pro Europa. With that, I will now give the stage to Professor Nabel. Yeah, thank you, Nigel. So it's a real pleasure to be here, to stand in front of you, and especially to be here with uh, Jatina Thwani. Uh, if I think back, I think it was two, three years ago that we first met. Then two years ago, we were together in uh, Berlin, uh, there was a high-level meeting in the Canadian Embassy. I was keen to go to the Canadian Embassy for the first time. And then uh, in the evening, we went to a typical German brewery, kind of microbrewery. And then Jatin took out a, a scribble book and started to make pictures and draw his ideas. And this was something that uh, I would think is the, the start of this initiative. So he got so enthusiastic about it and uh, I thought, well, if, if he gets enthusiastic, uh, I also think about it. And after this, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and the University of Waterloo, they came closer. We had some exchanges of uh, s staff. We uh, now have a collaboration agreement that is just about to be signed to exchange students, to ex change uh, staff and also to have uh, joint projects. And I think this is a, a very good idea, a very good uh, project, as Jatin will show in a second, where we try to get lecturers, scientists, bright people together who would like to devote their knowledge and their ideas to, as the title says, people who have little or hardly any energy access to bring our technology uh, to these people to make them feasible 
uh, to be applied in rough environments where normally industry doesn't really care for. And uh, I'm really happy to be here for this uh, launch event. I'm uh, proud that the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology is part in this event. And I think now, uh, Jatin, it's yours to present this initiative uh, to us. Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to all of you at this uh, launch event. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, the launch event, of course, Affordable Energy for Humanity, if not now, when? This is, as Joaquin mentioned, a partnership of the University of Waterloo and Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, uh, and we are now at the starting point. Uh, let me begin with a simple proposition. To suggest to you that energy is a fundamental enabler of human betterment. Availability of energy is intricately linked to our quality of life. And furthermore, access to energy service remains a powerful driver for a whole host of goals and objectives we may try to achieve such as the recently announced United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. That there is an urgent need for a global energy transition is actually relatively clear. Climate science provides us with the foundational basis for that judgment. What this does is bring into a very sharp focus, in my view, two of the the most fundamental scientific and technological challenges of this century. How can we provide affordable energy to the mass of humanity that is also clean? Where are the practical solutions? How do we get there to a low carbon energy future that does not leave a third of humanity in the dark? Here is a picture of a NASA satellite image, a composite picture that many of you will have seen over the years. It is a stark reminder of the light and darkness, disparity of energy access globally. Hans Gosling, the eminent Swedish demographer, actually puts this a lot better than I can. And he observes, he says, 1.5 billion people in this world have both a light bulb and a washing machine. The next 4 billion have only the light bulb. And the last bottom 1.5 billion have neither. So rooted in this disparity, I think, is the source of so very many of our confrontations and debates around the questions of geopolitics of energy security, effect of energy use on climate change, and the ideas around affordable energy access. So I'd like to ask a provocative question. If lack of access to modern energy is not available to a third of humanity, what can you say about a sustainable energy future? Now, energy's link to life quality is as clear as it's compelling. And here I show a metric, easy to remember, and it provides an anchor. Annual GDP per capita on the left-hand side annual kilowatt hours of energy access per person on the right-hand side. At the bottom of this ladder is what lack of energy access delivers. A quality of life that is an offense to our scientific and technological capacity to deliver. At an annual energy consumption level of less than 100 kilowatt hour 
per person or at that low income level. Life is brutish, short, and nasty. To paraphrase Samuel Johnson. All of Sub-Saharan Africa is in this category at the bottom end of the parts of Latin America, parts of, of Asia. You can think of Sierra Leone, Chad, Ethiopia in that 10 kilowatt hour per person level of access. Some others around Tanzania, Uganda moving up to the 40 to 50 kilowatt hours per person. All of Africa in the order of 150 kilowatt hours per person if you take the billion people of Africa. Nigeria, an old rich country, is barely at the 100, 150 kilowatt hours per level of energy access. Moving up towards that basic quality of life, in that 750 to 1,000 kilowatt hours level of access, we begin to see enormous change in indicators of social well-being, life expectancy being one of them. The next level or tier category of, of energy access, income access, income levels, if you wish, is that the global average is around the 3,000 3, kilowatt hours, EU in the 6,000 6, odd kilowatt hours per energy. As you move up to the highest levels beyond the 10,000 kilowatt hours per level of energy access and in incomes, multiples thereof, uh, we can begin to ask the question, have we put enough focus on issues around energy efficiency, conservation, perhaps trying to lower levels of energy demand to take the pressure off the challenges around the climate change question. There's a rough estimate of around the investment required to get the two billion people to a level of energy access of around 1,000 kilowatt hours this would be $2 trillion over a 20-year time frame. And if you think in those terms, it's not a very large amount of money in terms of what it can do to impacts on life expectancy. When we look at the composite indices of human development, energy, influences or impacts human development through all these factors such as productivity of labor, national income, population health status, education, social development. This picture tells volumes here, speaks volumes. It's an enduring feature of this image. It's not only just the effective use of light from lampposts to do your homework, although that is central. But in my view, it reveals a deeper desire to learn, to reduce the boundaries of ignorance, and somehow push the envelope of darkness behind. I summarize a vast amount of information in just this one slide, and let me walk you through it. Of today's global energy consumption, 85% is fossil fuels, and 15%, this is annual primary energy demand, is non-fossil, essentially hydro, nuclear, wind, and solar. By 2050, global energy demand will double. The amount of energy that we produce annually today is 15 terawatts. So that's why I have the number there, 15. It's a nice summary number. 15 terawatts, terawatt years, actually translates into 500 odd exajoules or so. But that is the global primary energy demand annually. And that is going to double by 2050. So we're looking at another 15 terawatts to be provided uh, over the next four decades. If we now accept the challenge that emerges from climate science, the carbon emissions into the global atmosphere have to stabilize 
preferably in the 450 parts per million, but no more than 550 parts per million. And what that will require is removal of anywhere from seven to perhaps eight, to perhaps nine gigatons of carbon emissions into the atmosphere on an annual basis. Now, if you begin to think in terms of the next 15 terawatts, that's a gargantuan amount of energy required that would have to be non-carbon sources of energy to get anywhere close to a, to a supply mix that is, in essence, 50-50, not 85-15, by the year 2050. Now, imagine every power plant, pipeline, processing plant, the entire global energy infrastructure today delivers 15. Now, you're going to have to replicate that in the next four decades, and that has to be non-carbon sources of energy to come anywhere close to getting to a 50-50 supply mix that could help stabilize carbon emissions into the atmosphere. That is the nature of the challenge. It is not a trivial challenge. Let me calibrate for you these numbers. What is a terawatt in simple terms? It is 1,000 1, megawatt power plants operating every hour of the year. One gigaton of carbon removal from the atmosphere translates into, in essence, turning off 700 odd similar sized 1,000 megawatts coal power plants to be able to remove one gigaton from the atmosphere. And the challenge is around eight to nine gigatons by 2050. Okay? So I remain entirely unimpressed with the rosy scenarios that are put forth by a whole host of researchers around the question of one or the other preferred technology that will deliver uh, a low carbon energy future. Please be forewarned, this is a fundamental substantial challenge. Let me emphasize, in case you are skeptical, where, are we, where am I getting this number of a doubling of energy demand by 2050? Well, population growth, this is demand for energy largely determined by demographics. The existing structure of the global economic production and shifts in the development profile within population groups, in essence, moving from energy poverty to something that is less so. So by 2050, world population essentially increases to 9 billion plus. 9.7 is the latest number I see. With no change in the global development profile, Another two or three billion people would be living in poverty. And that's the base case on this slide, the second bar chart from the other side. The next profile reflects something along the lines of UN millennial goals, the desire to improve living standards, to eliminate extreme poverty. And that's shown here as the so-called low poverty world. And the next one is a depiction of a relatively prosperous world, however you want to define that. So the pressures of population growth and the goals to raise living standards combine to set a formidable energy challenge here, either way a doubling or tripling of energy demand by 2050. This is the most recent view of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. And it provides compelling data and information on the state of climate science and the risks associated with carbon emissions. The red line here is the high emission scenario. Oh, this is on the left-hand side of the curve of the chart. And the lower blue line is the low emissions scenario. There is some overlap in the near future, but the divergence and the threat as we look to the rest of the century 
becomes entirely clear. On the right-hand side is a color-coded chart of the risks, such as extreme weather events, threat to unique ecosystems, or large-scale singular events, and their potential severity. The darker colors at the high end of the temperature scale would suggest high to very high risk. The policy goals are to stay below that two degrees C line that I've put on this. Now, I have drawn that line on this chart to simply draw your attention to the broad tenor of policy disputes and discussions uh, around that two degree mark. The official IPCC chart does not include that line. So, in terms of practical action, it's the eight gigatons required reduction in greenhouse gas emissions on an annual basis to keep, to keep risks relatively low. For all the near Herculean efforts by so many with such good intentions and well-meaning commitments, all the talk of targets, timelines, and treaties, the line has not moved very much. Two decades and after two, and two treaties on UNFCC and Kyoto, climate diplomacy as practiced by many governments of the world has failed to produce any discernible real world reductions in emissions of greenhouse gases. Now this is a dispiriting story. Carbon continues to hold our civilization in its grip and in my view, this is a long journey, 85 years perhaps, three generations, to get ourselves down where we may be able to flip the ratio 15% fossil fuel and 85% non-fossil fuels. A little bit of evidence to just make the point that I've made it would have been some comfort to see the trends at the global level either stabilize or show some decline. Year after year, decades after decade, the growing evidence and data provide little comfort. Our political processes rely on diplomacy but diplomacy is severely constrained by what I call a zero-sum game strategy, meaning I can win only if you lose. I think this needs a real shakeup. The reality is that energy demand will double or triple. Why? Because population goes up and the really poor will become less so over time. Emissions continue to rise because fossil fuels remain entrenched in the supply mix and cheap fossil fuels continue to undermine other options. Now, is there a wild card in the pack here? Can science and technology provide the necessary breakthroughs? This is an ecosystem view of the overall energy system. A low carbon electricity ecosystem that takes into account the scale of the challenge in the energy and climate space and offers a way of thinking through the reality of our existing energy civilization and how a global energy transition can be achieved with select transformative technologies. Getting to a low carbon energy future places an enormous burden on innovation. Technological innovation for sure, but complemented by business and policy innovations coupled to broad societal acceptance. Our previous work 
through the Waterloo Global Science Initiative, a partnership of the Perimeter Institute and the University of Waterloo, we addressed all aspects of a low carbon electricity ecosystem comprising the four core elements of baseload power, smart urbanization, electrified transport, and off-grid electricity access as shown in this picture. Today, of course, my focus is on off-grid access. Over the past six decades, the mantra of rural electrification was elevated to a high level of, of what I would call rhetorical flourish. The reality on the ground proved insurmountable. The extension of the traditional grid, the transmission and the distribution system to those without access continues to remain elusive. So can technological innovation offer any hope through off-grid electricity access to serve distant and dispersed communities? Some data to calibrate the nature of the challenge. The really poor at less than a dollar 25 per day or the poor, let's say, with income levels around $2 a day, are with us in about the same numbers one decade over the next. This is over the last couple of decades. For electricity access, we do see some improvement. But this is mainly a China story. Removing 500 million people out of extreme poverty in China has had impact on the access question. For the rest of the world, long way to go. Poverty is, of course, coupled with lack of energy access. It perpetuates a vicious cycle of energy poverty. Time is consumed by drudgery. Lack of energy prevents income generation opportunities. Low productivity equals low earnings. Low earnings equals no cash surplus. No cash equals inability to pay for improved energy access services. Thus, the poor become the energy poor. Two separate worlds and an image to make a point. So where is the magic and who has the more energy? The gross amounts of energy being transported on the backs of these ladies as bundles of wood or bags of coal being dragged up a hill may be large, but it is drudgery that is theft of time. It actually has been a long journey over two centuries of scientific and technical developments and practical know-how when combined has resulted in innovation that provides you with powerful smart devices. So I say when energy as raw fuel meets the second law of thermodynamics and Maxwell's equations, magic can happen. Transformation that can change lives for the better. This Maasai herdsman here with a smartphone in his hand now has access to the world's entire knowledge base. He can tell you prices of meat on an Nairobi market, predict the weather, he can communicate essential features with his family, and perhaps even tell you the best sushi restaurant in Waterloo. Ordered energy is the magic here. It has much higher value, and convergence of the information and communication technologies with the energy system holds enormous profit, promise for transformative change. This image uh, illustrates very clearly the social tensions 
in the debates about centralized versus decentralized power systems, the disparity of access, and why we cannot ignore provisions of services to the most needy. Now, the economic calculus that fails to deliver electricity to the distant and the dispersed communities is one thing. Challenge, but it's one thing. The inability to extend services within easy reach of the existing infrastructure speaks volumes about the business models that remain indifferent to the needs of many. In these charts, I try to unpack the challenging questions around cost, affordability, and value. The first point is this. Energy requirements for human development needs is actually quite low. The cost is or can be high for meeting these needs. For people living with no access to electricity, the first few hundred watts can power life-changing tasks such as turning on lights for reading, work at night, charging mobile stations, mobile uh, phones, communicate with family, running perhaps a small refrigerator for storing critical medical supplies, and so on. And there are, of course, also niche applications where this will be the, the case, small amounts of energy providing high value. So the idea that tiered levels of energy services at different price points has a different value depending on the context and the situation is a hidden point that requires much further scrutiny and analysis. The amounts of electricity needed to address many of the problems of energy poverty is not so great. Small, small amounts, even at high costs, can provide huge value. I'll come back to this to discuss further on how innovations in business practice can advance our thinking. I want to tell you, I want to share a story with you. This is as told by Dr. Laura Steckley out of Berkeley, California. She is a medical practitioner and went to West Africa to study medical practice in a rural environment. And this is as she tells it. Imagine you are one of the 15 million pregnant women who suffer a complication during childbirth. This is the sort of statistic globally. You are poor. You're on a dirt floor. You've been trying to have the baby for two days at home, but something is not right. Your family struggles to get you to the nearest medical facility. You arrive at the hospital after an arduous journey, and this is what we have, a light in a maternity ward. So the midwife struggles, find out if the baby is alive, tries to establish the state of your, your condition, and at the same time, through heroic effort, perhaps locates a doctor who might perform emergency surgery. And what do we have? This is the operating room. No light. Well, why? Because there is a power shortage, or the backup generator is not working. There's an outage. What is otherwise a routine medical procedure in our world and source of much happiness for a family, birth of a child, is now a near life and death proposition.
energy poverty impairs the ability to conduct emergency care, midwives trying to start intravenous lines by candlelight, delivering babies in the kerosene lamp lanterns, surgeons struggling under these conditions. You're looking at maternal and child mortality of 50 to 70 percent. So there exists a medical infrastructure here. No light. And what would it take to turn this operating room into this? It can become functional, 15 watts of power, right? Four 2.5 LED lights, five watt for, for the ambient light for the, for the surgery. And how so could you do that? This is the solar suitcase developed by Dr. Laura Steckley and her husband, an engineer husband, and now, of course, established through a not-for-profit organization called We Care Solar. You can look them up on the, on the YouTube or the website. It's a flexible, rugged platform designed to provide reliable DC electricity for any kind of environment where access to power is critical and unavailable. This innovation, born out of, of urgent necessity, I think is a powerful example of what can be done. It comes with everything you might need to provide instantaneous power right out of a box, medical light all light along. It can be mounted permanently, or it could be used in mobile applications. Here is the small problem. It costs about $2,500 or so, which is five, six times the average person GDP per capita in the kind of world we're talking about. It weighs about 16 kilograms. Yes, it's mobile. So I would pose this as a challenge to our innovation community. Can we not get this suitcase down 10 times lower cost, 10 times lower weight, or any other combination that, that might work? It's just an illustration to say where what types of innovation that we need to focus our minds on that would actually begin to make a difference in the lives of people. So low-cost innovations that are flexible, portable, robust, low prices can shape the critical pathways for meeting human development goals. The innovations can also be driven by other needs. For example, Displacement of, of expensive fuel to be delivered to distant locations, whether these are military forward operating bases or refugee camps, indicate many uses with such potential application for, for potential for application and reduction of costs. And so I have developed what I call the 10 commandments for engineers uh, to unlock the barriers to energy access. And so here are the design criteria, and I'll reel them off just so that you get a sense of where we perhaps might want to go. Low cost, obviously, and think about full, cy full cycle life cost. They have to be robust, durable, compact, easy to transport, easy to install, modular and scalable, minimal technical expertise, limited maintenance and operational requirements, limited additional infrastructure. That's 10 of them. Is it so difficult to be able to achieve that? Open question. This is just to highlight but one domain of research. For example, if the goal is to design more efficient and stable devices, the strength for organic, of, of the organic photovoltaics research or line of research is in the diversity of materials 
that can be designed and synthesized for the absorber, the acceptor, and the interfaces. Often referred to as solar by the meter, their plastic nature makes them easy to transport, use, and install. They're light. They can be installed into or onto irregular surfaces due to their extreme flexibility. On a piece of cloth, perhaps, rolled up and carried to the installation point and laid across. Installation requires no special equipment or skills. The tent on the right-hand side here has the capacity to deliver two kilowatts of power from flexible solar panels daily. So it would not be long, in my view, if the innovators put their mind together and for the solar suitcase to become lighter and cheaper, perhaps by a factor of 10 or more, and the battery performance is improved by a similar margin, the solution can become truly scalable on a global world. Okay. That's the, the line of thinking. The burden of fuel wood gathering or water collection falls disproportionately on women and young girls, consuming in excess of six to eight hours per day to support a family's cooking and heating related needs. This is the true tragedy of energy poverty. Time, the most important asset available to every person is taken up, practically stolen, in the struggle for meeting basic needs. This is the poverty trap that shuts down the pathways for education, social, and cultural development. So progress with expanding access to modern fuels and technologies in developing countries over the last 25 years, not to put it too finely, has been dismal. That's an understatement. A World Bank review, recent report five years ago of lending for improving access over the period 2000 to 2008 concluded that only about 1% of the lending was devoted to promoting more modern cooking fuels and devices. More efficient devices and fuels are out of reach for the majority of the population in rural areas. And the so-called widespread diffusion of improved cooking stoves has yet to happen in spite of many demonstration projects being piloted around the world. Time, available fuels, and capital are inherently substitutable at one level. The example here is heat for cooking. Left-hand side of the picture shows time costs are high. Efficiency of the stove is low, and so is the capital cost. Now you substitute capital intensive, higher efficiency stoves. Of course, you, you reduce the fuel costs and the reduction in time spent collecting wood for fuel, for example. Introduce modern fuels, and you reduce time budget even further. So shifting to more capital intensive stoves not only reduces the time spent on fuel supply, but it also improves indoor air quality. So now it's not so difficult to connect the dots here. Energy is a powerful vector for change. Time freed from gathering fuel or drudgery in general is then available for more productive use. This increases the opportunities for income generation, 
And this in turn would allow investment for better devices. This in turn would lower pollution exposure and improve human health outcomes. So the energy access challenge can now be seen as part of the important linkages and dependencies which we need to understand better to shape positive outcomes. Although I have only so far touched upon light and heat to illustrate the essential points, we must recognize that a portfolio of solutions would be necessary for energy poverty reduction because of the diversity of needs. The quanta of energy requirements for one set of needs, say lighting, may not be sufficient for appliances such as refrigerators or for pumping water. Also on the right hand side of the image, we show how local sources of available energy in all its variability and quality has to be aligned to the size of the needs of a community. Diversity of needs and availability of local resources will shape how the relevant technologies and solutions can be effective over a wide range of performance and price points. I've been challenged, so here is an answer to the question. How can you ever make a successful business when your market is the low end, poor of the world, surviving on less than $2 a day? Reasonable challenge. Well, let's take a sharper look at the quantity and price and an understanding of the market segmentation that might provide some clue. I frame it as a four-tiered approach. Earlier, I pointed out that small amounts of energy, tier one on this chart, has enormous potential for human development needs. So that's the first step on the ladder. Yes, the cost is high. But let me also point out the source of the tragedy here. The effective cost of lighting computed on the basis of the amount of electricity needed to deliver the equivalent lumens via kerosene or disposable batteries are actually very high, very high, as high as something in the order of three to four dollars per kilowatt hour, okay? So the paradox is this, the poorest of the world are paying something like 30 to 40 times the cost of a kilowatt hour that we do in our world, which is 10 cents a kilowatt hour or so. Evaluations by the World Bank, again, this, within the last 10 years, makes a very compelling argument that the value benefits of lighting for a family are in the order of anywhere from $35 to $50 per month. Much higher than the $2 to $5 per month that would be the cost for such a family, for a household. Again, the tragedy is that even that level of cost cannot be borne. Poor are strapped, trying to get themselves a level of energy service that's commensurate with their needs. Survey of the Millennium Villages indicates that 50% of the households spend between five to $10 per month on such poor substitutes as kerosene. So the poorest in the world are actually spending 30 to 40 times higher to get that lumen of light and yet are not able to transition to something that's cleaner and better. There's a barrier that you need to understand. And this tiered approach to getting to a, to a sense of what may be different vectors for productive use of energy, needs for larger amounts for communities, 
and entrepreneurs to set up businesses is the way to think to see where you might go. And this is for real. So I like to emphasize the notion of microgrids. Microgrids can deliver benefits through cost savings relative to low cost or low, low quality energy fuels and technologies. A microgrid in simple terms is an aggregate of small sources of demand or loads as the electrical engineers might call it and distributed generation sources. It operates as a single system that provides both power and heat. A microgrid's distributed energy resources can include a high frequency AC machine such as a micro turbine and DC systems perhaps like solar cells or fuel cells. This is but an example of an analysis that shows how tariffs for microgrids can result in unit prices of electricity in the order of a dollar per kilowatt hour. The implication of these cost differences is such that you can actually deliver a large amount of consumer surplus if you add up A, B, C, D, and E on this chart. This is analysis performed at Carnegie Mellon by Jay Apt and his group and is well documented. What it begins to get at is the question of, even though microgrids may be perhaps 10 times more expensive than the 10 cents a kilowatt hour that we get here, but looked at it from a tiered perspective on different segmentation of needs, it can actually generate economic surplus that somebody might set up a business. The energy access ladder emphasizes the points I've already made, provides a framework to think about categorizing and ranking energy systems and their capabilities. For example, in this chart, we show that customers can pay as little as one-tenth the price per kilowatt hour with a microgrid compared to the per kilowatt hour equivalent energy price of a cook stove. On the energy access ladder, microgrids are positioned somewhere between individual home systems, which are intended to provide only lighting, cell phone charging, or a small radio, and a central grid, which of course is designed to provide unlimited access to electricity at all times. I touched upon this earlier. The idea of a smart energy network offers a promising path. A smart energy network is a general energy network that uses advanced information and communication technologies to monitor, to manage flows of energy services from sources to use. That's the left-hand side of this picture. The so-called smartness is in the coordination capabilities and optimization of all energy flows from suppliers to energy transformation, delivery through infrastructure to end users, energy market stakeholders, and operation of all parts of the system as efficiently as you can. This is not a linear path, but we put forth an ecosystem view of energy flows and information and its convergence to help achieve low costs, better environmental performance, and at the same time, achieve reliability, resilience, and stability. Rest reassured, I'm coming towards the end of my talk. It's relatively clear that the scale and complexity of change suggests that transition to a low carbon economy will take a long time that the global dimensions of energy poverty is an even larger and deeper social and economic problem, that compelling global need for a non-carbon source of high quality energy is absolutely necessary, and this will require radical improvements, orders of magnitude improvements in efficiency and cost reductions. Many perspectives converge on this whether it's the International Energy Agency or the IPCC or the Global Energy 
assessment, the need for radical action cannot be understated. And I'm going to quote from the global energy assessment that massive diffusion of new technologies for meeting the thermal energy, motive power, and electricity needs is required to meet the grand challenge of improving energy access. This requires innovation on both technological and institutional levels, providing universal energy access to electricity is not only a moral imperative, it delivers substantial social health and environmental benefits. End of quote. This brings us to the launch. I am glad to welcome you to this launch event. Our website is now active. We are undertaking a major global change initiative. This will be an active partnership comprising leading researchers at universities and other institutions devoted to advancing the research basis for practical solutions. There is tremendous enthusiasm and the two anchor organizations are University of Waterloo and Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And our goal is simple. We want to break the barriers that feed that vicious cycle of energy poverty. And we believe that science and technological innovation can make an important contribution. Research will inform practice and those non-governmental organizations already working in the field, implementing projects and solutions, will provide feedback from the lessons learned, the barriers that they face. How is it that we can improve best practices? What can research and science do that might help people working in the field? We are fully cognizant of the fact that Technological solutions form but one part of the overall picture. Our colleagues in the social sciences bring strong insights to how solutions are adopted by individuals and communities and bring a deeper understanding of the social forces that would make some of these solutions sustainable in the long term. So we are building partnerships to help make a difference in the lives of those who have very little. And this will require a multidisciplinary challenge and approach. How do we intend to proceed? We have identified four domain areas as shown here, generation devices, advanced materials, microgrids for dispersed power, ICT for energy con convergence, environmental and human dimensions of energy transitions. Let me begin by emphasizing the environmental and human dimensions of energy transitions. To understand the social and cultural context and not to repeat the mistakes of the past, For long-term sustainability, we need a clear understanding of how those solutions will be adopted in the context of the lives of people, the way they live their lives. Fundamental breakthroughs in physics, chemistry, material sciences will form the backbone of what you might think of as transformative technologies. But to go from scientific insights to devices and integrated systems is a long journey. But we remain enthusiastic and positive about the role of information, communication, technologies to help shape the pathways ahead. I won't go through this in detail, but to give you the range, depth, and diversity of the domain 
areas at a finer level of granularity. Against subdomains, we can begin to identify the areas of focus that would ultimately translate into orders of magnitude improvements. Even at the level of a subdomain here, it is still fairly general. For example, solar or wind or batteries and so on. The effective work will be at the le level of research clusters and there will be many under each domain or subdomains. The interconnectedness among the research clusters is shown by the arrows to make one point. Yes, they are interconnected in some indeterminate form, but we want to move away from silos to join hands with others in different domains will remain a key aspect of how we can be successful. This is my attempt to provide an illustration of a specific cult cluster and how we envisage effective collaboration to flourish. For example, leading researchers at different institutions working on issues of energy storage could, could be advanced materials for batteries, would come together as active participants as long as they see a fruitful strategic alignment of their interests. As for funding, we begin with the base that we have. But in parallel, we will work to obtain additional funds from what I call traditional sources, such as national research funding organization, and also non-traditional sources, such as philanthropic organizations, industry, and business. The output of a research cluster would also inform other research clusters. And here I show how advances in storage, for example, can influence development of microgrids at the system level and also establish meaningful contacts with researchers working in the field of microgrids. Microgrids, when they are robust and reliable, can begin to provide affordable power to communities. So this global cha change addresses the challenges of universal access in a comprehensive way, at a detailed enough level to provide confidence that we can deliver effective change. And we will have to work as multidisciplinary research teams to make these advances. Our goals and objectives are clear and simple. We want energy services to be affordable so energy poverty can be relegated to a footnote of history. We would like to be judged by future generations in a positive light. A global environment that meets the need of future generations without compromise. Here are the, is the contact information. And this is the link to the website that has become active as of today. I thank you for your attention. We welcome your support in any form whatsoever. And I will leave you with one last thought, and it's a quote that comes out of Jefferson which says, no problem can withstand the attack of sustained thought. We will deliver. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. And I think there are microphones uh, around so that for recording purposes, uh, that will be available to those who are not being, a, being, uh, being able to attend. Any questions? Sure. Um, yeah, so it's an exciting initiative, and I think the um, 
the first 10 watts is a really exciting space right now where you see some, some things happening. Uh, I'm wondering, you mentioned uh, sort of how the, the terms of reference are figured out and getting feedback from nonprofit organizations. Um, I'm curious what your take is on uh, companies like MCOPA or Off-Grid Electric that are, are trying to bring those first 10 watts and price it at a kind of daily level below the price of kerosene. Is there an interest kind of in figuring out what are those companies' needs or, or get feedback from, from their investors or anything like that? Yeah. Thank you for uh, raising that point, and I'll make two observations. Uh, first and foremost, uh, if you, when you go to the website, you will see that we actually have partners. We're partnering with uh, NGOs that are active in the field like Practical Action UK is, is, is but one example. We're talking to a whole host of others. Uh, so the desire is, is this clear, uh, whether it's a foundation, whether it's a government uh, uh, aid, comes from uh, foreign aid programs, people who are working in the field with real projects, uh, running into all manner of issues and challenges. Uh, we need to know who they are. We are identifying and have identified a number of them, and they'll be active in this initiative. So that's the first observation. Because we want real life lessons to inform research directions, and researchers, as they develop their insights and solutions, some of course longer term, others on an ongoing basis, can help feed back to improving practices in the field. You, address, you asked the question around companies, and there is actually, this is a recent development. It's a very positive development in my view. The number of, of, of companies reliant perhaps on, on uh, philanthropic intent, but nevertheless, they want to run them as businesses to make sure the, sustainable, uh, the solutions remain sustainable over the long term. Uh, one observation I would make is that I've seen quite a number of them uh, would make announcements, all good intent, excellent on paper plans uh, are failing in the field. And the observation I make is that they're failing either from a financial perspective or implementing these solutions, partly because first they don't, or, or the, the, the level of complexity in, in providing effective solutions in very difficult environments, distant, dispersed parts of the world where infrastructure is very poor, you underestimate that. Number two, when things do fail, the supply chain of expertise to assist, to provide solutions is non-existent or is there but not as, as strong as it should be. So we are hopeful as we work further into this program to identify companies that have an interest in uh, working with us so that we can link them directly to researchers as they produce their solutions, and there can be an effective feedback between corporate entities that are trying to make a difference in the world, just as the NGOs are trying to do the same. So that's the desire. Yes? So let's pretend that fossil fuels were completely clean and that they didn't contribute to climate change. <clears throat> Would that be a sufficient solution for getting the poor their first electricity, or are there barriers to that? You, you of course, posed a pretty big if, but for the sake of uh, uh, answering that hypothetical question that fossil fuels are clean, uh, that is, they do not have any carbon association, uh, carbon emissions associated with their use. I don't believe that's credible, but for the sake of discussion, let's assume that's the case. Uh, the current paradigm is exactly just that. The fossil fuels are being used, kerosene is being used, uh, notwithstanding its, its both uh, pollution effects as well as the climate change challenge, uh, because they are the most cost effective. They are the cheapest. In fact, they're cheaper because we have not taken into account the externalities 
associated with these fuels. And so because they are where they are uh, is the solution that people go to. Uh, but to the extent that uh, uh, the requirements of getting energy access to the really poor uh, at price points, if you have clean fossil fuels, I would say I have no argument against it. That would be. It's a very big if, and it's not a credible uh, uh, position to say fossil fuels are clean. But if they are, then it's quite important, in my view, to get to the energy access question, because it has such powerful uh, consequential impact on people's lives in a positive way. Yeah. presentation um, you make a very compelling argument for global change but my question to you is um, I'm interested to know if you will also include demonstration projects locally I'm, I'm working with about nine organizations locally that want to change the way we use energy in this community mm. and that number is growing mm -hmm. um, is is there any value to your initiative to demonstrate smart energy networks, microgrids in this community, whether it's our rural areas or you mentioned urbanization here. Is there value in that for you to demonstrate that? Because we're very interested in it. Yeah. Uh, I would say absolutely and yes. Uh, we already, he's here, Professor Claudio Canizares, are working uh, on microgrids in remote communities in northern Ontario. So this is as much a focused on the the global picture and the developing parts of the world. We also have a problem here in Canada in terms of getting, let's call it clean energy access to our remote and dispersed communities where evolution of solutions around microgrids when they're robust, more cost effective and so on would, would, would be very credible solutions for our needs in the northern communities uh, where we don't have the grid. That said, uh, we would very much like to also have this particular initiative, uh, let's hope, become part of the, the pathway or, an un, or, or excitement for companies that are working in this field who want to innovate, who want to develop new solutions, who want to work with researchers to test out new things, that they begin to see where the global markets for their products and services would be perhaps outside Canada. So it's a, you want a self-reinforcing uh, positive feedback loop, if you will. Any learnings, insights out of research, whether it's done in Canada or in Germany or in the UK and, and as part of, of this group of, of, of uh, researchers uh, would and should be fed back to those who will actually pick up on those insights to develop solutions, whether it's for homegrown markets where there's a need or external markets where they may have uh, New opportunities. Yes, 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 twice and twice. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, Claudio. Thank you. Very interesting, uh, Jatin. I guess I've been involved in this from from the beginning. Now, what, one of the questions which I don't didn't notice mentioned in your slides is the role that governments have to play on this. My my experience with uh, remote microgrids has been that they have a lot to say and a lot to contribute and can make a big difference. So do you see a space for them to be part of institutions to be part of this? And yeah. how do you envision that happen? Yeah. Again, uh, uh, an important point around the question of role of governments, uh, the barriers they create, or the extent to which they can actually be very effective enablers of how solutions could be implemented. Uh, so let me speak of the role of governments in a positive light. We can't do without governments. It's necessary. We need some frameworks, institutional frameworks, legal mechanisms, a whole host of, of, of the kinds of things that governments provide that would enable this solution to be implemented, whether it's in Canada or in parts of Africa or Latin America. So the government can play a positive role in, as, as, a, as, as an enabler, if you wish, of, of uh, 
the frameworks around which these things could be actually implemented. Where I would like us to think and move away from government as the funding source that will fund these activities ad nauseum until, and then only because it is government that will, I think there's less and less appetite that perhaps, yes, governments to the extent they're willing and, and, and able to fund uh, some of these programs, and they do currently through international aid development programs, uh, is a positive. But for, for solutions to become truly sustainable, uh, I think they have to be on the basis of, of businesses that will drive them in ways that, why do I say that? We've seen enough failed projects initiated with good intention by NGOs, philanthropic organizations. They're active now. They're all over the world. And you see as soon as the funds drop out, projects fail, disappear, there's no buy-in. Uh, so you need a convergence of, of sets of solutions where if they make sense for people who actually are going to use it in their lives, in the context of their lives, and innovative business models that begin to get at the question of their needs, then I think it will become truly sustainable. It's a matter of faith on my part that that might be the case. Okay. There's one there, and then we'll come to Julie. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I guess my question is, again, as, a, as an engineering student, what sort of research or technology do you think there is an urgent need for in order to help facilitate this transition to a sustainable future? I don't believe in what you might call the magic bullet as the solution. I think we have to be, begin to see in terms, in, in, in terms of suites of solutions, okay? So a, a particular solar-based solution with the right battery combination that may be the perfect solution for parts of Africa where that's a, a ubiquitous uh, abundant resource uh, might be one. If you then want to think of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where sunshine may not be as prevalent as perhaps in other parts of Africa, just to make an example, uh, you might need a slightly different suite of solutions, and it could be microhydro, it could be biomass sources. So the generation sources could be different, the types of technologies at at many micro hydro levels and so on might be different and how they get integrated into a solution that provides relevant amounts of energy in the community context where they live would be different. So think suites of solutions. What may be applicable in Africa may not be in Vietnam or Peru or Ecuador and so on. So this is a global problem. There are, it comes in many colors and we need to, of course, have the basic sciences provide the framework around which these solutions can be developed into credible solutions, but the end solutions will vary, and, and so be aware of that. Yeah. I, just want to, um, tie I just want to tie together a couple of the um, previous comments that were made. Um, number one, uh, the whole idea of uh, the role of government, especially de-risking um, from a financial perspective some of those advanced materials, uh, advanced research advancements in the advanced materials space that are required, um, which are really part of the long game here. Yeah. Um, but also um, just in terms of the university's role in and of itself, I mean, there's incredible capacity here, both from the engineering um, department, the, the whole power engineering capacity here, as well as WISE as well as the um, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial uh, culture within the university. Um, could you comment in terms of what could actually come out of the university itself in terms of you know, just that base of resource um, for some of the possible short-term solutions, maybe from ICT or whether there are specific design advances that could be made on the things like the solar suitcase? Thank you, Julie. Uh, the, I call the universities a large underutilized 
resource, both in terms of the actual physical infrastructure that exists, certainly at University of Waterloo, perhaps at KIT. Uh, and I've been around enough universities, uh, and there are people who are partners in Cambridge University, Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, you name them. Universities are an underutilized uh, resource. So the first view I've taken is, I'm gonna start with what's there. As soon as I get an active participant, he's a member, he or she is a member of this, and we work with that. Now, uh, the role of government in, uh, as you mentioned, de-risking, or perhaps the basis around which we might do long-term thinking, basic research, is absolutely crucial and necessary. My answer around role of government was in fielding field projects and see if we can find a way to move away from that. Uh, but when it comes to the funding required to provide a basis for research, uh, a lot of private sector enterprises simply do not have the appetite for that. So the government does have an enormous role in terms of, of let's call it underpinning the fundamental research capacity at universities, whether they're in Canada or in the UK or US or, or uh, Germany or anywhere else. So that role will continue, and to the extent that they have, uh, that there are, there's an appetite for supporting this end goal objective as part of it is, is, is absolutely crucial. Uh, okay, what's around the corner that, that may actually really begin to, to, to change things that uh, I think we, we, we have to uh, begin to think of, of and I, I tell my colleagues in, in power systems to say, right, now give me a microgrid in a shoebox, right? So that takes you to miniaturization of, of you know, dematerialization or miniaturization, uh, material science, vast improvements in, in, in uh, storage capacity of, call it batteries. Uh, solar field is moving very quickly and we're into the next generation of uh, developments of solar technologies which will be low cost, better efficiency and so on. So there's a combination of, of real solutions within the next two to five year time frame that can actually be picked up by people who want to turn them into practical solutions for implementation in the field. Uh, and we cannot underestimate the role that, that the ICT sector can play. So to make a, a simple point, when I was in London, UK, a friend said to me, hey, he has a Tesla. And he showed me on his app, his Tesla sitting in Mississauga, that he could actually turn on and off the vehicle, knew the charge level of batteries in that car. So I would ask Claudio and say, well, now help me understand, why can I not control a microgrid in uh, Namibia from here in Waterloo? Is it that far a stretch? Think of it, okay? Uh, yes. It's another amazing product from a renowned university. Um, as far as the major issue um, of power, clean power and affordable power, not just Africa, but the rest of the world as well. And it requires a lot of effort because even now, the most um, dirty power still comes from the West, from the developed countries. So, you know, making an effort, a consolidated, a consolidated effort addressing that issue is quite, quite a humble work, a passionate uh, delivery. But as far as the, the Sub-Saharan Africa and all of the least developed countries is concerned, the, it requires another dimension. It has to be sustainable, okay? So you need uh, another group of the university, the, uh, the people who would be able to create a business case out of, uh, out of the whole exercise, which is uh, in order to be able to have those people that you showed caring would or uh, you know the, her the pastoralists and so on, to be able to afford anything, the first thing to do would be to raise their uh, production capacity. They should be able to pay you know ten times what they are making now. So any kind of solution, particularly energy type of solution, should be able to enable them. 
enables them to produce tenfold yeah. from one dollar a day to ten. Well, one thing that I'm working, let me just share with you, is that an investment-based approach, say if we collect from the whole world, you know, some $1,000 a day, you know, $1,000 per person for, say, Ethiopia, 100 million Ethiopians will require 100, will get $100 billion. If you were to enable those people, increase their productivity tenfold, okay, that they would more than be happy to pay back 10% rate of return per year. That would also substantiate to acquiring this kind of technology and others in their livelihood. So uh, think through to engaging the, um, the, site, the business people, the uh, people who are working in integrating rural communities together and making this into a bundled solution that would enable them improve their productivity. That would really uh, make it even sell further without having to depend on donations. Mm. Thank yeah. you. No, I, I, I completely agree with the trust or the point you're making or the line of reasoning you put forth, and that's exactly where, where I'm at in terms of, of, I made the point earlier, energy has excess or energy access, enormous potential for improving, let's call it labor productivity or productivity of an individual. If you're not collecting wood for eight hours, perhaps uh, you might be able to do something else with your life that would become that much more productive. That would generate a degree of income that can then be a self-fulfilling virtuous cycle in terms of how that person can, can uh, get more access to energy and then do other useful things that will get them out of that trap, which is extreme low incomes and you know, where, where they're not able to, to advance. Uh, I, I've said, I mean, this so-called $2 or $1 uh, line, if you wish, is just what it is. Uh, often people have asked, uh, what do you mean by affordable energy? And I have a very clear and precise definition around that, that the disposable income of somebody who, love, who lives on $2 a day ought not to be more than 10% of the energy cost ought not to be more than 10% of their disposable income. That's a a measure that the economists have used for here and, and other jurisdictions. It's a figure of merit as a target, clear target to say, if you can get to that, now you're freeing up that person to get out of being a $2 per person to perhaps three, five, ten, And as soon as they do, they themselves become a very powerful market for people who may be producing the sets of solutions that will emerge out of this kind of work. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? If not, we will... Uh, yeah, we have to get out of the room, I'm told. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, I'll take one more if there is. Otherwise, uh, I thank you for... Yes? I'll take the last question. Sure. Uh, it was an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, just having worked on uh, large-scale uh, uh, renewable projects consisting of solar, biomass, and wind, um, one challenge that I've seen is in terms of uh, the financial component of bringing it to the energy deficit community. Um, you know, typical polycrystalline today cost about a dollar per watt peak. You had shown in one of your slides a uh, tent with an organic uh, solar PV, which uh, you know probably would be three or four times the cost of a polycrystalline PV. I uh, just want to understand uh, the focus. Um, you had mentioned the technological focuses of the group. Um, what specific initiatives is the group planning to sort of subsidize the cost? Because this sort of stretches on the, on the role of the government as well today. The last mile uh, connectivity problem is, is the financial burden of this. It is very difficult to subsidize it. Even if governments uh, say that they have subsidized programs, they are actually not getting implemented on the ground. This is what is happening really on the ground. Yeah. So what is the specific focus of the AE4H group yeah. in terms of uh, you know, making this affordable? Yeah. Okay, so you, you raise uh, two points. So let me go to the part you talk about, the large solution. Let's call it uh, the large grid, large wind farms, large uh, 
solutions that really come through the grid, if you wish, or come through uh, transmission and distribution systems. Uh, and that has been a, a challenge. Uh, so to the extent you build a large wind farm, that gets power gets fed into the grid, but that grid is not able to get to distant and dispersed communities, partly because of the investment requirements for, for getting to that last mile that you last inch that you talk about. And that has been a proverbial uh, problem over the last 60 years. We just uh, Politicians will say, we'll bring the grid to you, but it just has not happened. So the transformative change that we foresee here is this, that to the extent that it is, from a strict economic standpoint, difficult to deliver levels of energy services to communities that are distant and dispersed, that we begin the focus around microgrids that rely on local resources that meet their needs where they live. Over time, this will evolve to interconnected systems, and they may get to a point where the nearest distribution grid is available for them to be hooked in so they can become part of a network. But we're not going to wait another 100 years or 50 years to get there. So we say the sets of solutions that are what we call dispersed power through microgrids is a very promising area that will begin to get at the question of what governments have not delivered over the last 60 years. In, in terms of the solution around solar PV versus organic PV versus different variations around solar solutions, you are right that the both the efficiency is low of the plastic that I, I put forth and the costs are, are also high. And so at a fundamental level of basic research and sets of research activities that we have colleagues who are involved here, that's the challenge to them, to say, how do we evolve the basic sciences to a point where you can break these barriers? And if, if, if Cavendish Labs at Cambridge come up with the solutions around photonics and so on, brilliant. But then what do you do with that insight to turn it into devices it's in, in, in systems. So that will take you to different sets of uh, developments that will be that will be necessary. So uh, to those who say, you know, this technology is not the problem. We have all the solutions we have. All we have is a problem of government interference or corruption or this, that, or something else. Uh, all those things may be true, but the technology is not there to deliver the kinds of services at price points that is meaningful to people in this kind of a context and significant amount of new technological development and when successful massive deployment of that will be necessary to really break the back of the energy access question. I think we'll stop there. Thank you.